started. Good. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, to yet another edition of Arcu Gaming with Sasa. Uh, we are very happy that you're here. Um, as always, some announcements in the beginning of our session. Um, so, as you know, these events are organized under the umbrella of Sasa. Um, and SASA stands for Safe Asian Studies Alliance. So we are a nonprofit um, that are trying to reverse the current downward trend of people studying the ancient world, uh, mostly in school, but also generally uh, uh, in our society. Um, fewer and fewer people are, it seems, um, studying and taking classes um, on topics in the ancient world and we think that's a pity and we think the ancient world is fascinating and interesting and everybody should know more about it and learn about it um, so our nonprofit is trying to combat that um, by organizing all kind of events um, in which we promote the ancient world and so we have book clubs we have Q&A panels we do all kind of stuff and one of the stuff that, of the things that we do is play video games that take place either in the ancient world or have topics that have something to do with the ancient world uh, because we think it's fascinating and the more people play these kind of games the more people are going to be interested in um, history and so that is great for us uh, okay, so if you want to follow Sasa, we are on all the social media pages. We are on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn now, uh, on YouTube. So all you have to do is search for Safe Ancient Studies and you should find us. And of course, if you're here on Twitch, please like us and follow us on Twitch. Uh, that would help us tremendously. Um, for this live event, as always, you are free to ask your questions in the chat and we will try to answer them. We have two uh, very specialized experts here who uh, will introduce themselves in a minute. Um, so if you have any questions at all for them about the game, about the gameplay, about the topics, feel free um, to reach out, put them in the chat and we will answer them. Um, as you know, this video is going to be recorded and it's going to be posted on YouTube and Facebook Live in a couple of days. Um, so this will be re-watchable. Um, and as always, have patience with our technology, as you already noticed. Um, Twitch is still not a perfect platform and we are still struggling to get everything to work. So if something goes wrong at some point... Um, Please be patient. We will be back. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of figuring out what went wrong this time. Uh, and so with further ado, let's get started. So today we are going to play Civilizations 5, which I ooh, have not played myself. Um, so I, I'm sure I will have a lot of questions. Um, and uh, I brought two uh, very renowned scholars uh, with me today, Michael Zimmerman and Lisa Borogin. Uh, who will introduce themselves now, Michael? Hello, everybody. I am uh, Michael Zimmerman. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at Bridgewater State University in Massachusetts. Uh, I got my doctorate from the Joukowsky Institute for Archaeology in the Ancient World. Uh, and uh, since then, I've been working and teaching in the area of archaeology uh, on and off for uh, the past decade and a half. Um, my areas of interest and in research include um, uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, brain fart for a moment, uh, <laughs> include uh, antiquities trafficking and art crime, uh, archaeological uh, ethics and decolonization practices, and mm -hmm. uh, innovative pedagogy in archaeology, which brings us, of course, into the area of archaeo gaming. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Uh, and hello. Oh for some God. reason, uh, I don't know why my cameras doesn't seem to be working. I'm staring at myself, which is always a pleasure. <laughs> we stare at ourselves way too much over these uh, video conferences, but no one else gets the pleasure of looking at me for better or for worse. But I'll see if I can come up with some kind of ugly avatar to, uh, to make up for that. Anyway, my name is Lisa Borgini, and I am an associate professor of communication. Um, and my area of interest is game-based learning. I've actually um, 
despite my technical difficulties, I've never actually used Discord. Um, I've seen some things over Twitch, so bear with me as I as I deal with these. The th kinds of games I like to study um, are, are educational games, and I look at games based within the classroom, but this game in particular looks very fascinating, and I love to share some of what um, I'm researching right now, which is the use of online games to, um, to teach about sustainability, and specifically looking at how Games can help motivate and involve students and help fight the despair of climate change, <laughs> wow. if that's possible. <laughs> Those are some big topics. Yes, okay. indeed. Okay, um, Michael, I think we are ready to start. Excellent, excellent. So uh, before we dive into uh, Civilization V, uh, just a couple of introductory things. Um, Number one, I chose Civilization V instead of the more recent Civilization VI for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one is that the general consensus in the gaming world is that Civilization V is really the best edition of Civilization that's ever been put out. Uh, and it's still relatively recent. It's easy to uh, manage and navigate. Um, the other reason that I chose uh, Civilization today is because... Um, a lot of my game-based learning has been focused around one particular class, uh, Anthropology 311, which is called the Emergence of Cities. Now, the Emergence of Cities is focused on, uh, among other things, the transition from a hunter-gatherer subsistence base to an urban lifestyle. And, uh, and really the emergence of cities uh, worldwide in multiple areas, but especially in the Near East. Um, the interesting thing also about Emergence of Cities is that it's focused around um, a number of different key themes. Um, one of these include uh, social inequality, which we'll talk about today, and subsistence strategies. But another is also climate change and sustainability, one of the main themes that we have, which is what, you know, why Dr. Borjean is, is, is also here and her area of expertise in sustainability, is that um, in Emergence of Cities, we discuss various ways in which ancient civilizations, either by example or by practice, can teach us how to live in a more sustainable uh, fashion. So mm -hmm. these are some of the things uh, that we deal with in that uh, class. So without further ado, I think we are ready to jump into Civilization V. Yes, please. Okay. So we start off here in the main menu, and I want to dive in because I, I always tell my students that learning begins sooner than you think. Um, can everybody hear the music in the background right now, sort of the theme music for Civ V? No. No. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the audio option. Oh, yeah. No, no. They, the, the audience can. Uh, oh, the we audience cannot. can, but we can. Oh, the audience can. Okay, never mind. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'll, so I'll leave myself can. here and listen on the other end. That's okay. <laughs> Great. Um, so this song is the theme for Civ V, and it's called Terra Nova. And the interesting thing is, is the um, lyrics, as you can hear, are in Latin but it's really based on what a lot of these kind of civilization building games are based on, which is the idea of conquest, expansion, mm -hmm. empire, uh, which is why one of the main, main themes that we can explore is social inequality. So if you translate the lyrics for this song, it translates, I saw a new heaven and earth, the holy city. I saw a new heaven, a new earth from God. The first heaven and the first earth passed away. Uh, a new earth, a new heaven, a new Jerusalem, a new Jerusalem, a new land, a new heaven and earth. Wow, and that is very Judeo-Christian. It's Well, number one, it's very Judeo-Christian, which <laughs> is not a huge surprise. But the other thing is that it ties into a lot of the how the processes of settler colonialism are ongoing. Settler colonialism and imperialism are ongoing elements. So, for example, uh, when we study North American settler colonialism and um, the way that the fir our first American settlers in um, and colonialists in Plymouth, Massachusetts, in Jamestown, Virginia, um, uh, and then their subsequent generations treated indigenous peoples, a lot of this was based on a concept called terra nullius or empty land. The idea, mm -hmm. this erroneous idea that 
uh, the land is ripe for the taking and it is primarily an empty land that is inherited by uh, that is in inhabited by peoples who aren't really peoples and we see this expressed in the game with um, what are called barbarian groups mm -hmm. so we see uh, when we play the game and I'll go to single player now um, you can see that uh, there are different civilizations that you play against, but there are also the so-called barbarian tribes. So this already mm. gives us a chance to explore with our students the theme of themes of social inequality and uh, imperialism. Now the other cool thing that we can explore here is that you can choose which civilization you play. And the interesting thing here is the mixture of sort of ancient and modern. So there are a number of different uh, familiar historical figures from Alexander the Great, uh, from Greece, uh, Ashurbanipal from the Assyrian Empire, um, let's see, Attila the Hun, Augustus Caesar, etc. But then you get to Germany and you get the more modern oh. individuals. So you get Otto von Bismarck, Casimir III of Poland. If you go down to England is actually Elizabeth. Uh, so these are all throughout times. India is Gandhi. So they're all together on one map. So they're all would be all together on one map. Wow. And well, the so entire what, process uh, goes from what, a single I, city and then the civilization grows from there. What I was going to mention is that one of the things that I really like to look at when I look at games is how is the game framing reality? Mm -hmm. And it's a really powerful thing that can either be very conscious and very unconscious. And so I noticed like framing all these like powerful leaders on like as like kind of a scroll list is a, a fascinating way to kind of look at his history because mm. you know you've got Gandhi right next to Genghis Khan and so <laughs> it's, it's just a very those two would most likely not get go uh, they would not get along very well I don't think no I can't think of a greater juxtaposition like, yeah exactly it's an interesting juxtaposition. And, and what it does almost is it's kind of like an unconscious kind of framing of he, what does it mean to be powerful? What does it mean to elicit change? And both of these right. leaders did this in tremendously different ways, right? Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of like who made the cut, the best the best of the best, uh, right? as perceived by these people who made the game, uh, made the cut. Sort of a, a battle royale of all the... The, the gods of the past, the heroes of the past against each other. Yeah, like Napoleon in France, for example, is a, another more modern example. The So there's, is nice there only one leader per, per civilization? There's only they, one leader per civilization. So they had to choose the most important one for each You do, but for, the, for the most part, what people are going to choose are the bonuses that you get from choosing that civilization. So for mm. example, if you choose Napoleon, creating museums and world wonder theming bonuses are doubled in their capital uh, the underlying theme for this is of course thinking about the history of Paris and the Louvre as possibly th the largest museum uh, in the world yeah, yeah. so um, so somebody asks is there information about why certain individuals were selected do you know? I honestly don't know. I can tell you that this is the expanded version. So you generally only start out with a certain number of possible civilizations or leaders to choose from. And then as you purchase expansions, more civilizations are uh, able to be added. Hmm. The other interesting thing is that these are based around sort of like the three main uh, paths to victory in the game. Uh, in general, there are three main paths of victory. Uh, the most common one that you see is, again, rooted in imperialism, and that's the idea of military might and expansion. Uh, so, for example, if you look at uh, Alexander or you look at Ashurbanipal, you can see that they are, are sort of military... Uh, focused here. Ashurbanipal, when a city is conquered, gain a free technology already discovered by its owner. Um, and this ties into the idea that the Assyrian Empire was was historically a very, very brutal uh, empire. Um, then there are other examples that are more focused on building and trade. So, for example, if you look at uh, Ahmad al-Mansur from Morocco, um, it's focused on the idea of trade. Uh, 
So the idea is, is that these three different paths to, techno to, to victory in the game, which are um, military might, uh, building and trade, and culture. So for example, if you go down to, back down, where's Napoleon? Back down here. Museum and World Wonder theming bonuses are doubled in their capital. So the idea of like this uh. would be a culture focus. Oops, I don't want to actually choose Napoleon, but yeah, that would be a uh, culture focus. Also, Babylon would be a great example of a culture focus too. You receive a free great scientist when you discover writing, and you earn great. So interesting. Faster. Because um, there are a lot of these kind of um, strategy games that only have military might as the as the winning strategy, right? I think of Age of Empires and other um, games like that. It's interesting that at least they try to come up with other ways for how to win history um, than just dominating everyone. Yeah, and 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 that's the interesting focus of um, of civilization, and really has been the one of the founding elements of the game going all the way back to the uh, board game version to the all the way back to the first civilization and then to the board game version uh, under Avalon Hill um, is that idea but it is also important to know that no matter what path you choose military is still a very very important element so mm. because for my saved game I chose Nebuchadnezzar the second of Babylon uh, I'm going to choose Nebuchadnezzar again so you can see um, uh, so you can see the sort of progression um, that I had made in the saved game. For map type, you can choose... The, this is the interesting thing, too, is that you can choose Earth, which is the actual Earth map, but you can also choose random continents. Uh, you can choose to play in Pangaea, uh, hmm. in an archipelago system, um, a f fractal kind of... Uh, Earth map or actual yeah, map. so I think this is really, this is really fascinating because one of the things that most scholars in game research uh, agree on in terms of what makes a good game is it has to have at least three elements. There are other you know people debate about you know the importance of aesthetics and that kind of a thing, but um, it has to have agency, it has to have flow, and it has to have engagement. And so what I'm seeing here is that you have a lot of agency in this game because you can pick. You know which type of civilization you can even pick like what kind of uh you know background you want to have what kind of a uh, landscape um you know what kind of a ruler you want to be um and then i'm also seeing that because of the nice graphics and then also the music in the background that's kind of creating this epic feel to the game um it's kind of creating the sense of engagement and and fun right so i'll be curious mm -hmm. to see if flow is also something that's present i can't tell that yet because we haven't gotten into the game but the concept of flow is one in which you kind of enter the so-called magic circle of a game where you are fully immersed in that experience in some way. So so really to be a good game, just uh, looking at it for just basis on is this a good game, regardless of its educational um, value, is it does it have agency, does it have flow, and does it have engagement? Now it's also that wor worth noting, and this is something that I just saw in the uh, Twitch chat, um, that uh, the religion aspect of the game, the religion and culture em emphasis, is really only available with the expansion DLC. So the expansion really gives you the best opportunity mm. to explore um, culture and explore, explore all of these different historical elements. Now, let's also realize that a lot of the reality of this is going to go out of the window. While I can choose the, mas the map type Mesopotamia, and I can choose, for example, the number of players. Uh, I cannot choose what the um, uh, what my opponents are, what the opponent civilizations are. So, for example, in my saved game, Nebuchadnezzar II is right next to uh, Sidon, the capital of Turkey, and right next to Panama City. Okay. Right. So Panama City and Sidon are, are like the closest two <laughs> city states to where I am in the saved game. So hmm. when I hit start, hit start game, which I think we're ready to jump in at this point. Yep. Yep. That's kind of a geographical um, May the am amnesia of there. Be upon you, <laughs> oh, look at this uh, history lesson we're Babylon. getting here. Young was the world when Sargon built Babylon, some 5,000 cool. yeah, years ago. 
Long did it grow and prosper, and the wonderful, gaining its first uh, Mark empire Shepherd in the 18th century does BC the, um, under godlike Hammurabi, the giver of law. Of Although conquered by the Kassites and then by the Assyrians, Babylon endured, him and his son emerging phoenix like from its ashes things. of destruction and regaining its independence despite its many enemies. Truly was Babylon the center of arts and learning in the ancient world. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, your empire endured but a short Okay, did you click on begin our journey? No, I just figured that I'd let the narration the go. So some of the things you see here is ingenuity, we're seeing three great scientists when you BC. discover writing and earn great but science is 50% Babylon faster, so gone forever, great it benefits us to go for uh, writing and great scientists early, the empire back and then we also once do well with Bowman and creating our first wonder would be the walls of you build a civilization? Cool. Can we turn down the volume a little bit more? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, so for this, we would go to menu, and options, audio This options. is a good place so to find a city. So are we looking to turn down the Food and sound resources effects, are plentiful here. and speech? Press your I would all turn it down a little bit so that the audience can definitely hear um, your voice above everything else. Excellent. I think about 50% should be good. Um, how are we... How is this? If it's not, um, I'll let you know. Okay. Excellent. Much better, they say. So cool. one of the first things that you want to do is build your first city, which would be your capital. Now, when you're doing the, um, basically the uh, settler difficulty, which is sort of your first difficulty, um, mm -hmm. you will uh, have this little helper that'll tell you good places to found a city. Uh, in this mm. case, we're right next to a couple of uh, good resource spots in that area. Also, next to a river is also a, um, a great thing. Um, for every um, player is going to have these different advisors in settler mode. So this is my economic advisor. You're also going to have a cultural advisor and a military advisor. You can also explore a lot of things here. So for example, if you go, what are cities? And you can go to... Um, these different uh, explanations. Uh, there's also civil opinions. Well, these, ex these explanations aren't really what historians would define as a city, right? No, no, they not are necessarily. This like this is this is ma a main focus for your um, for your game. That mm -hmm. being said, looking at say the summary of technology. Technology is one of the driving forces behind civilization. This is most definitely true. It advances in the technologies of agriculture and fishing that allowed cities to grow and thrive. It was advances in weaponry and masonry that allowed some cities to drive us. Jealous barbarians who sought to steal their food and plunder their wealth. Gee, is that a colonialist point of view? Wow. <laughs> so, um... It was advances in medicine and sanitation that fought off the other great threat to civilization, disease. So a, lo a lot of the um, interesting thing here is that it, it this sort of civilopedia gives you uh, mm. sort of an instructional version of the game that sort of explains to you how each of it starts, but then also includes elements of sort of explaining the idea of civilization through the game. So as... As an archaeologist, I can point my students to the Civilopedia and have them look at, say, the summary of what artifacts are. Um, <laughs> here, again, <laughs> a very colonialist point of view in that you know they don't identify artifacts as objects made, used, or modified by human beings, uh, as archaeologists do, but as historical relics that can go into museums <laughs> and palaces. Oh no. It doesn't so get that, more colonialist yeah, than this. Exactly. And that kind of brings up for me one of the most important aspects of using games in the classroom environment or educational is that it's so absolutely important to build in an opportunity for debriefing mm -hmm. and also to really point out like this is a really great educational opportunity to to show how the game is framing reality and to kind of allow the students to really debrief from that because that is a almost an assumption that has been made over many, many years that we are, you know, really important for us to kind of unpack that, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And, and it, it can be really a great game, but it's not a great game educationally because we didn't take the time to really build in the debriefing. Right. And that's something that's important in any 
uh, pedagogical context. Uh, in the case of my Emergence of Cities classes, uh, all gameplay uh, was followed by um, an, a, an entire class worth of discussion based on uh, questions that were posted on online discussion boards on our Blackboard LMS and that are given to students ahead of time so that they're prepared for discussion. And these, of course, open up new uh, questions. So, for example, if I go back to the game for a moment. Uh, this is Civilopedia. Let's see, how do I exit this? Escape to exit. There we go. And I close this. So, this game, for example, starts with a single city. So you have a series of settlers who will build your first city. So you click found city, and of course, for Babylonia, the first city to be created is Babylon. Now, the interesting thing here that you can sort of ask right away is, you know, in this video game, and this is really the first discussion question that I would give my students, in this game, the player starts with a single settlement and then grows their civilization from it. So I can ask them, is this true to life? Can you give me examples from, say, uh, ancient Mesopotamia in which um, civilizations began as a single city-state and then went on to dominate others in a world system, you know, such as mm -hmm. Uruk, for example. Or are there other examples such as, you know, Chital Hoyuk, where a series of smaller settlements banded together to create a city, right? So mm -hmm. it really allows us to explore ideas of, you know, how are cities made? Why are cities made? How do cities become cities? And, mm -hmm. um, and then also, um, you know, how do these cities then become states? So, consider the sending your warrior out next to thing that we see here is once you've created the city, right, consider sending your warrior out to explore new territory. So you start out with two units, which is your settlers, which the settlers uh, basically allow you to settle new cities and to build things. And you have your warriors, which are not a huge surprise fighters, but then you can create new units as you move forward. So again, it's based on this idea of exploration and expansion. Do you find, Michael, that some of your students are somewhat overwhelmed by this? Because I would think that if people are gamers, this is going to be no big deal, but I can see a certain population of students really kind of, and this kind of gets at my point of flow, right? Mm -hmm. I can see some students, this is just a little too beyond their reach. Maybe it's a little too challenging. And what do you do when you have students like that? Generally, what I do when we have students like that is, um, is a couple of different things. Uh, number one, I supplement all video games in my, um, in my courses with board games as well. So ones that are done, you know, back when we were face to face before the pandemic, uh, ones that are done in person so that students can guide each other through the process. Uh, the other thing that I do is that generally students do not play these games on their own, but rather uh, play them with partners. And then I would act as a facilitator or instructor. So that way you can pair up students who are gamers with students who are non-gamers and they can assist each other in the process. The other issue is of course an equity issue. Not everybody, not every student, especially at a state university, can afford to shell out the money required to purchase a game such as this, especially when you consider that in order to increase its educational value you have to add all these expansions and DLCs. So that becomes kind of a uh, kind of an issue, but it definitely um, those two things definitely help. Yeah, I was wondering if you made this your textbook and the uh, had them purchase it through the bookstore, it could use their financial aid. In, entirely possible. Entirely possible. Uh, for my first Emergence of Cities course, which was in spring uh, 2020, <laughs> right when the pandemic hit. Uh, oh I had a, uh, a textbook and then would bring in my own games, uh, copies of games for students to play. Um, in further iterations of the course, the course is only offered once every three years. So uh, in further iterations, yes, there would be a, um, a single game, probably Civilization V, 
uh, to be chosen as uh, in, in lieu of a textbook or an addition to a textbook. Another solution might be is what we did at UNC when I wanted to integrate um, games in my class is we reached out to different departments and asked if use. anybody had um, a stack of computers um, that are fast enough or smart enough to play mm. these kind of games. And we actually found a computer lab uh, that also had PlayStations uh, where we could go and with a little bit of funding, we bought five copies of the games that we wanted to play. Mm -hmm. and left them at all times in that room and students could go there and play these games in groups or on their own so yeah. they didn't have to buy a playstation or a, or a good computer nor these games and they could be reused for any other class in the future that wants to use these games as well once bought they're there forever um, so that was a, a solution that we that we found yeah and th this is another reason why i chose civilization 5 because it's much more intuitive than the others it looks complicated but the great thing is the lower uh, right-hand corner here essentially tells you what you need to do. You can say next you have to choose your production. Um, so you can choose your research, choose your production. So you can just click whatever it's telling you to do. And in this case, uh, you can choose what your city produces. Do you want to build your first monument? Do you want to start creating workers so you can build more things? Um, do you want to build a scout, which is not a very strong military unit, but is great at exploring? So, uh, and then for each of these things, your advisors are going to tell you which you want to do. So, for example, we'll start with a monument, but we can also uh, choose to produce other units that can do other things as well. Next, it's telling you to choose a research. So, Excuse we can go with pottery, animal husbandry, archery, or mining. Uh, I might, and you can see each of my, your different advisors, your foreign advisor, science advisor, military advisor, or economic advisor are going to tell you to choose different things. But what you can also do is open that, up... Um, Sorry? I assume, that, I assume that none of the um, choices that you make are ever the wrong choice, right? It's not like you can break the game. It just gives you different mm. outcomes. It, yes, you exactly. And, and a lot of it is also the direction that you want your civilization to take. Uh, so, for example, um, what we'll do here is we'll open up the technology tree. And this essentially tells you what each new technology builds on. This is the other thing with the game which is a little bit more problematic. Um, because, as you can see from this technology tree, everything starts with agriculture. <laughs> hmm. The problem with that, though, is that it assumes that state-level civilizations only emerge from agricultural bases and it essentially um, denigrates or, or says, you know, civilizations that don't have agriculture aren't real civilizations. But if you look at the work of a lot of archaeologists, you can find that a lot of, um, a lot of civilizations which had for long periods of time had only... Uh, a hunter-gatherer or, or a limited horticulture base still thrived and had many of the elements of statehood. Um, plus, what do you do with civilizations that are incredibly far north, such as indigenous civilizations of the Arctic? They have mm. incredible levels of social complexity, but they don't have agriculture. So does that mean they're right. not civilizations? Or nomads, yeah or nomads and so forth. So mm -hmm. the question you sort of need to ask your students here is, you know, what are the problems with this sort of social evolutionist idea of your civilization evolving from, some, from like some primitive to advanced as your technology progresses? So how does because this that's compare essentially an ethnocentric to, point of view. Yeah, how does this game compare to say, you know, something like Settlers of Catan? And did you consider using a game like that instead of this one when you were first looking for a game? Um, I considered Settlers of Catan. I love that Catan has both in-person and... Um, and uh, or both has both board game and video game versions. Right. Um, but the thing that I found is that it wasn't teaching those elements that I wanted to teach. I think Settlers of Catan would be great for teaching, say, like William Rothschild's trade imperative theory, the idea that um, urban civilizations emerged out of the need to trade um, in order to gain resources that they required. 
um, which is a very, very interesting idea, and it fits Settlers of Catan so well, because you can't succeed in the game without that trading element. Um, but I found that other games did this more effectively. So, for example, with Emergence of Cities, I start out with the board game Stone Age, mm -hmm. um, in which is all about looking at um, uh, Neolithic period uh, hunter-gatherer groups that are just beginning to create agriculture. And uh, that particular game is all about managing resources during the uh, during the um, Neol during the period of the so-called Neolithic Revolution or Agricultural Revolution. Uh, so you can explore things like, say, Lewis Benford's demographic theory of uh, agricultural expansion, for example, um, through games like that. So, yeah, I mean, I love Settlers of Catan. I think that in, in order to be a true gamer, you have to have at least one copy of Settlers of Catan in your basement somewhere. <laughs> um, but I, I don't think that it... I don't think it has quite the variability to teach the things that I'd prefer to teach in the classroom, if that makes sense, Lisa. Yeah, no, it does. And, and I, the part of the reason I asked was because I thought that the cost for that might be a little less. And mm -hmm. also because it has that flexibility of board game versus online versus single player versus multiplayer, you know, it has a lot of flexibility. And also, um, you know, one of the other things I think you have to consider when looking for a game for the classroom is the amount of time you're willing to invest. I mean, it almost seems like you have to be willing, if you're going to use a game like Civilization V, you have to make sure that it's enough time in the classroom mm -hmm. to justify both the, the investment of time and then the investment of learning how to play the game. So it's that's what makes it probably a good game for your purposes because even though it takes a long time maybe to kind of set it up, there are so many different aspects that can be explored um, through this game. Yeah, and and there, there are some. I think a lot of that comes down to the same thing that, um, that all game developers do, uh, whether it's board games or video games, which is play testing. Right. And I think that's the that's the element is uh, is finding students that are able to play test these different games and um, and test their efficacy. So for example, in these blackboard discussion boards that I mentioned, for every game that I incorporate, and I only incorporate uh, three in my Emergence of Cities course, um, for every game that I incorporate in that blackboard discussion, the last question is, how efficacious do you think this game was in uh, helping you achieve the learning objectives for this unit? Oh, that's good. So, um, so for example, for Civ Five, just reading this off, um, you know, in the discussion question, uh, lastly, what thoughts came to you when playing this game? Was it effective in allowing you to explore ideas in how civilizations expand, urbanize, and colonize? Are there things about the development and growth in civilizations which the game demonstrates effectively and then others which they demonstrate ineffectively, inaccurately, or not at all? Does this game allow you to have fun and become engaged while exploring these concepts? So, like, things like that with every single discussion board that you have following a game is that feedback system that allows you to gain from your students uh, their experience in it. And I, and I think this is also where uh, something that might be even more helpful because students I think would be more truthful if it was not the instructor asking these questions. So it might be helpful to bring in uh, someone, for example, from uh, your, your university's Office of Teaching and Learning to administer, mm -hmm. these, um, to administer these questions anonymously so that you can get accurate feed, you know, more accurate feedback if students aren't saying, well, it's the professor asking these questions, so I have to say that this is the greatest thing ever, you know. You know, it would be great, too, in some colleges and universities that uh, faculty can add optional questions to the teaching evaluation, and it would be wonderful if that were something, you know, uh, you could do that wouldn't necessarily affect, you know, it would be a question that wouldn't show up as a way you're being evaluated because that would kind of encourage people maybe if they were to experiment and it were to fail you wouldn't want to penalize people right so anyway to get back to the uh technology tree so one of the some of the things you find is that each of the technologies that you have sort of builds on the other which 
kind of makes sense, at least from that kind of social evolutionist point of view. So, for example, if you're not mining um, metal and stone, you would never develop masonry or bronze working, right? If you don't develop masonry, you're not going to have be able to develop, you know, uh, construct great wonders and things like that. Without bronze working, you're never going to have iron working. And so that fits this kind of, I'd love to see them incorporate um, reductive lithic technologies in here. The idea of flint napping or stone tool making would be a great thing to see rather than these sort of traditional westernized uh, technologies. I'd love to see that sort of element here. But so for example, if I choose mining because I've got a lot of mines next to me, that'll bring me to masonry and bronze working and construction. As you can see, if I stick with sort of bronze working and iron working and metal casting, um, that brings me into machinery. So I'm sort of in like in this building kind of tree. If I go with archery, right, I go with archery, the wheel, you can see why this tree sort of, like my military advisor told me to do this, because archery and the wheel and horseback back riding bring me to not to, sorry, it's just to civil service. There's another that it's supposed to bring it me to. Where's the, uh, there's, there's one, oh, because each one gives you like horseback units, so caravanseries, circus maximum. So each of these technologies brings you a different thing. So being able to mine allows you to build pyramids, the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, the walls of Babylon, uh, construct quarries, clear marshes, um, Get bronze working allows you to create spearmen, uh, barracks, uh, the statue of Zeus, um, and, and other things. So, for example, if I was going, I mean, let's start with mining, because there's a lot of mines around me. But if I went with masonry, then I'm taking sort of the building um, tack. If I go with bronze working, then I'm probably going more with like a military tack. If I went with pottery, and then from there went to writing. Actually, I think writing is actually a good one because I think I research writing a lot faster as a um, uh, as a Babylonian. You can research writing a lot faster and you get a, a great scientist sooner. So I think I'm going to go with pottery first. And click close. And then other things you can do, unit needs order. So again, this will always tell you where you're going. Uh, to you, With left click, you can move the mouse around. With a right click you can move a unit and it'll tell you there'll be a one if you can move there in one turn uh if you go to a two then it's going to require two turns see how that just turned into a two there right so i'm going to actually explore up this way and then it says next, next turn right and time goes by now you see here as the turn goes by i've gone from 4000 bc to 3,960 BC. So in one turn, 40 years have passed. <laughs> so the passage of time is not exactly realistic in uh, in this game. So is there, is that, I'm wondering if you have created, have you created like tutorial videos or like a, like here's, you know, here's an example of that or, or anything like that for, for your non-gaming students? Or is that something that you think would be like way too much of a time investment? I think I think that a tutorial would be more of a time investment. I think the, I think the process, and I and I try to explain this to my students, is that it's important to allow games to be intuitive. I think if you include a lot of instructional elements in terms of just learning the game, then it becomes, then you're sort of overloading your students a little bit. You're giving, you're saying, um, you have to. In order to succeed in this class, you have to learn how to play the game, but then you also have to le learn all of the archaeology that comes along with it, too. And I think I'd rather have students simply use the game to sort of explore these questions as opposed to excel at the game. You know, like winning, winning this game should not be... Um, should not, I, I think, be the, um, the main focus. Now you'll notice here that, of course, un units move much more quickly through like open land and open areas than they do through jungle. You see, I was able to move pretty far in the open land, but as soon as I'm in this forested area, I can't m move more than one spot per turn. 
So what happens if you just keep moving back and forth? Like time continues and you time haven't done anything? Time continues to pass. Yeah, time <laughs> continues to pass. Now you'll notice here that um, if you click on the city, it will give you some... Uh, it'll let you know what's going on, right? Uh, right now, for example, we're in the middle of building a monument. We still have four more turns to go. Uh, you can also use your gold, which you can uh, earn as the game moves on, to purchase different things. Now, right now, we don't have enough resources to purchase anything. But as the game goes on, we'll be able to purchase more. Um, other sort of markers that you have here are uh, essentially what's required to sustain your civilization. You have uh, food, which determines how fast your city grows, how fast it acquires new citizens. Um, again, this definitely fits the sort of city-state model where you have an urban center and then you have a periphery that grows food and creates resources for the city. So again, it's this very Western sort of city-state model. Then you have production, science, gold, culture, and faith. And faith, that religion-based aspect, is sort of part of the added DLC here. <laughs> With a dove. With a dove, of course, but that same Judeo-Christian kind of element. So with this unit, I don't really want to explore this forested territory because I can't move very far, and I don't want to move my warriors very far from... Um, so you can see I, move, I can move a little far, further uh, if I'm not in moving in forest. So I'm going to move it closer to Babylon and explore over here so that in case um, some, a threat shows up, I'm, my warriors aren't far away. And so if you go back here, you see it's now instead of four turns, it's three turns until the monument's done. And then you can continue to also expand. So if you have enough money, you can also buy adjacent tiles in this uh, sort of whitish blue line, which is the boundaries of your city-state, will grow as you buy additional tiles. So I can see this game is, is very immersive, and it probably includes like a really strong sense of flow among those people who really get the game and who enjoy the game and that sense of like lo loss of time like if you've ever been in a game where you're just like playing and then all of a sudden you're like oh my gosh it's five o'clock i had no idea how how did all that time go by that's that's a really great example of flow but at the same time i can see there being a strong technological divide and i saw someone wrote in the chat that they that they as a non-gamer would also kind of feel that way and i could see that there would be students who the, the, it, in order to maintain flow, there needs to be this nice balance between it has to be challenging, but it can't feel overwhelming, right? If right. it's too easy, it's not going to be flow. And if it's mm -hmm. too hard, you're not going to hit flow. So that sweet spot. And so, um, you know, that's why I'm wondering, like, the other thing that makes a really good game is you have to make sure that everybody has a role. You don't want people just sitting back doing nothing. And I can see that there might be an instance where somebody might kind of check out if they're feeling like this is too much. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that would be a great opportunity to give that person a job, right? Like right. what is the non-gamer's job in observing this role, right? Like, so, okay, if you're not, you know, just observe what's happening and then maybe give them a special kind of role. I don't know if that's something that I've had, I've had situations like that when I've played games in my class where I've, you know, sometimes that non-traditional older student, I hate to stereotype, but mm -hmm. you get the, the non-traditional older student who's like, you know what, we got to take class over Zoom and now you're asking me to do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so I have often found that if I give them a specific role, like I want you to observe how many times this happens, or I want you to observe, you know, what's happening with the conversation or what's happening, you know, how is the, like maybe even just the passage of time, like how does that affect the game? Right. But I don't know if that's something you've ever played with or or had any thoughts about. It has, it has not been something I've played with, but it's something that I would uh, definitely uh, love to see. Um, I was I was lucky in that the students that I had in the class who were gamers really stepped up and acted as leaders and supported those who were not. Um, the That's great. other thing that I found that was useful because I, I love that you talk about roles here is that I would give the uh, like I said I would partner students up and uh, 
students who would, um, you know, in the case of board games, everybody was playing. But in terms right. of a video game, what I can do is I can partner students up and I can have one of them, um, for example, focus on uh, the actual play and play elements. And then I can have the other student focus on the discussion questions. How is, how is the way that my partner is playing the game affecting the way that we see uh, the answers to these questions that are associated with archaeology? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I was talking about. So that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. That's a great way to kind of harness different people's abilities and interest levels. Because really, one of the things that I, I really truly believe, and, and I've read this from other game researchers too, is, you know, a game is, if you have too much downtime for mm -hmm. people, if, if people don't feel like they're really, they have to wait too long between turns or if they're kind of disengaged, that's a, that is not a good game for educational purposes or otherwise, but it's right. it's hard sometimes with games of big classes because you're going to have people who aren't necessarily going to be checked in. And so how do you keep them engaged? That's the perpetual problem. Right. Our capital city has finished. So building. our capital city's, city's finished construction. So we have the monument complete. The other thing you can do with production is you can create a queue of production here. So for example, uh, you can create a worker and then you can go to you can change the production at any point but then you can also create a queue so if i go back uh show queue and i go add to queue and then i'll add a scout to that so first they'll produce the worker and then they'll produce the scout so the other thing about this game is that it is it is kind of you know you're right lisa it's a long-term game there is some downtime here but the nice thing is, is it'll also remind you of things that you need to do. And this is the, the other interesting thing that sort of Civ Five has, which is very useful for, like this would be useful in say a political science course, the idea of adopting a social policy, <laughs> right? This is kind of like the same thing as a technology tree, only the focus rather than on technology is on what is the social direction that your city is going to take. Are you going to adopt uh, a piety, for example, which would be um, essentially, are you going to create a theocracy? Oh, that's a Jewish high priest, I can tell. So uh, there's our Judeo-Christian stuff again. Yep. I'm, a, I'm a biblical archaeologist. No, uh, archaeologist. I, I completely <laughs> understand. I completely understand. Um, are you going to develop a more traditional social structure that is based on the around the idea of um, monarchy in the traditional city-state. Are you going to adopt a policy of liberty in which uh, individuals are allowed to do their do their own thing, but is also focused on sort of rapid expansion? Are you going to focus on honor, which is is basically the military route here? So you can see for tradition is like you can do this for sort of small empires is sort of the traditional way. Liberty is for sort of for um, rapid expansion, especially rapid cultural expansion, uh, honor is for army, and then piety is great for, for culture and building as well. So I, I would like to ask my, um, uh, I would ask, like to ask my co-presenters here, of these different social policies, which do you think would be, would most interest you if you were playing this mm. game? And we can only choose the ones that are highlighted. Only the ones that are highlighted. The other interesting thing is once you adopt and complete a social policy, then new policies uh, called ideologies emerge. So ideological tenets cannot be purchased until you've chosen an ideology. So basically, as you move into the modern era, new um, ideologies emerge. So in the ancient world, you have tradition, liberty, honor, and piety. But then right around the period of um, the Renaissance, uh, or the classical era, I should say, um, which is not the Renaissance, but the classical era, like uh, Greece and Rome, the idea of patronage emerges. Uh, right around the time of uh, the medieval world, of the Middle Ages, the ideology of, um, uh, of faith emerges. And then you have the emergence of rationalism during the Enlightenment, mm. um, exploration, you know, there's the Renaissance era, the medieval era, 
commerce, aesthetics. So it, it, you know, each of these emerge at different sort of eras in your civilization. And you can see here they're, they're sort of not in order. They start patronage and aesthetics in the classical era, uh, commerce and exploration in the medieval era, and then in the Renaissance era you get rationalism. It kind of reminds me of um, when I was in college, I was an academic debater, and we would uh, have to choose a criteria for by which we evaluate the debate round. And we would pick, you know, liberty or uh, freedom or any you know, utilitarianism. It kind of reminds me in a way of, of you're asking your, your, the players to identify the criteria by which to evaluate, you know, what's, what, is, what is success. Right, right. Now, the other, uh, a couple of um, interesting things here. Um, you can do uh, a one-player game, but you can also do, uh, through Steam, you can do an online mode and play against your friends. So you just need sort of um, the game and a laptop in order to do that. Um, and you can, it, essentially, it's a, like a, a co-op mode. Um, but in the chat, it also says that it can get very competitive between friends when you start sending spies to invade your, invade your friend's cities or send religious prophets to forcibly convert them. So <laughs> The question in the chat asked about, are these generic prophets? So. Uh, I believe these are generic prophets. I'm not sure. I don't believe you name them. So as a historian, I think I like tradition the best. Tradition. Okay. So with tradition, you start with the idea of aristocracy and oligarchy. And then <laughs> you move on to legalism, a that. landed elite, and monarchy. Jeez, I, I, I do like monarchy. I'm, I'm, a, I'm from Belgium. We still have a monarchy. <laughs> it has a, a soft that. spot in my heart. <laughs> oligarchy, I'm not so convinced about. No, um, but the interesting thing here is that it also allows a discussion of how how agriculture also led to greater social stratification because the idea of an urban society or an urban environment uh, when people were moving around things tended to be much more egalitarian you would see a much more egalitarian worldview but once people were no moving no longer moving around people were able to collect stuff and once people were able to collect stuff, some people had more stuff than others. And this is where we see you know, the discussion of uh, centrifugal tendencies versus centripetal tendencies. The idea of, um, of there no longer being one community, but the idea of you know, serving the smaller family unit versus serving the larger community. Mm -hmm. um, being an issue that we can talk about. So we'll, we'll go with uh, a Tina's suggestion and we'll adopt tradition. Are you sure you want to adopt the social policy, Tina? Yes, yes, yes. There you I'm go. going for it. So then as we go, as we produce, we'll be able to add each of these different elements until we complete the tree and then we can unlock another um, ideology if we so choose. Are you locked in then once you've picked? Can you go back and say, oh, I, I messed up. I actually don't want or I want to do liberty instead. Or are you just like, nope, you've chosen. I believe you can at, any, at I believe that you can choose a different ideology at any point. What is this verse from the Bible here? Um, this is the interesting thing here is that uh, each time you research a new technology, they give you a quote. So sometimes it's from the Bible, sometimes it's from other sources. So when you discover pottery, you get the quote from Isaiah 45, 9, uh, shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, what makest thou? <laughs> so um, this allows your cities to build a granary, which provides more food. And you can also build a shrine, which is the sort of the first faith producing building in the game. So each of these different elements down here, your research, science, uh, money, happiness, um, progress towards the golden age, like the more, um, the more happiness you have, the f closer to the golden age you are. And then your culture can increase. So your next, so your next attempt to, so there's two more turns until you can adapt another policy. So now you have to choose what your research is going to be next. So we can open up the technology tree. We can go to mining because we have all of these salt mines. 
or we can move on to sailing the calendar or writing. I'm going to suggest writing because it's advantageous for the, our choice choosing the Babylonian civilization. So, and then we can move our warriors to explore a little bit more. And there's another ancient ruins discovered right there. So, next turn. And then play progresses in this sort of turn-based fashion uh, for a while. I'm going to head straight to those ruins. And we've encountered our first barbarian nice. encampment. No. So, and this is... Are these just, um, just random barbarians? They never get... A name or they a never get a name. They never get a culture. It's, as I said, it's a very kind of Eurocentric viewpoint in this game. Mm. It's, it's, it's still a leg up on other games such as Age and Empires and the like because there's more of a cultural element uh, to the civilization building, but there's still this, this very, very sort of ethnocentric elements here. So Earlier in the chat, somebody had asked about a different game. Um, I had to refresh and I lost the chat, but it said Europa something. Europa Universalis. I yeah, have actually never played that game. I've never heard of so it, so I, you're yeah, one of... I, I've, I have never played it before. Um, but, I mean, the addition of... Um, barbarians to this game also allows us to ask another interesting question you know barbarian forces tend to be entirely opposing forces you can't negotiate with barbarians you can't trade with barbarians barbarian it's you see what I, see what i mean how it's a very very kind of eurocentric viewpoint and the mm -hmm. interesting thing is anybody familiar with where the term barbarian actually comes from well I do but and I don't. I'll, I'll, I'll let the uh, the audience stay. No, no, it. no, Timmy, go ahead, go ahead. Does anybody familiar with where it comes from? Doctor Blackheart's um, no. got it. <laughs> yeah, from from Greek, mm -hmm. but specifically, it's um, those who don't speak Greek are barbarians because it sounded to people as if they were saying bar 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 bar. At least that's the background that I had been told wonder what language did they hear because of course greek was surrounded by many cultures like was mm. that what kind of language w did they did they hear that they heard a lot of bar 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 sounds <laughs> well i mean it's it's kind of it's the interesting thing is that that idea the very term barbarian is incredibly ethnocentric because it's assuming that those who don't speak your own language are uncivilized mm. And it ties back also into that idea of ethnocentrism or culture shock. Uh, another game which I'll use, not in my Emergence of Cities course, but in other anthropology courses, um, is uh, Bafa Bafa. Have, have any of you heard of that game? No. No. Um, yeah, yes, I have used that game. I've actually used that game in my classes. So, Lisa, you have used Bafa Bafa. Yes. It's it's kind of an interesting way to teach ethnocentrism and culture shock, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and that's what I've used. I've used it to teach that in my communication class. Um, it, I actually used it as a final exam. I've had mixed results with that. With that, it, it works sometimes really well, and sometimes it's a little too simplistic. Um, and I and I have a, a harder time with certain c certain students who don't really get it until the game's over. It's it's I, I want. I almost want the expa expansion pack. <laughs> but... <laughs> the game came out in the 70s. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. We've been waiting a long time for an expansion pack. But um, but the, the interesting thing is that students find, essentially what happens in the game is you create these two distinct uh, cultures, quote-unquote, and then you send observers to... Uh, the other to these other cultures and in one of them um, students create their own language which sounds like Bafa Bafa hence the name of the game oh. so th something that um, students experience is they ex experience firsthand the culture shock of not being able to understand the language and still having to try to communicate and it's not just that the, the it's actually built in uh, structurally that you will offend the other culture because 
the way that you show respect in one culture is an incredibly insulting gesture in the other. And they have built in hierarchies, like some of them, it's basically um, mimicking the difference between high context and low context cultures. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, demonstrates those rules really, really well. So it's a, it's actually pretty fascinating game. I I wish when I say, you know, jokingly expansion pack, it's an in person game. I just wish that um, there was a way to make it a little bit longer and more involved because Mm -hmm. once the students kind of get the gimmick, it's like the game is kind of over, right? And I'd like to have it explore a little bit more. Maybe, maybe I've just had not as great luck with it in, uh, in making it a more developed conversation. The students really enjoy it, but I, I think it depends on how willing the students are to really kind of role play. Sometimes you get the students who are just kind of like, they're not really taking on the role because they're like, I don't really want to do that. Right? Right, right. And I think that there are there are certain elements. So, so for example, one of the cultures is always a patriarchal culture, which then creates its own problems because then you have the idea of of individuals who have ha- ha- had their own experience, usually unpleasant experiences, with patriarchal cultures, and now it's sort of like up in your face. Um, and then there's also the one of the inherent elements sort of in the design of the game which is difficult as anthropologists is that cultures are not closed systems right so the idea of not being able to ask people about their culture or not being able to to influence the culture or things like that but i think it'd be an interesting game to explore so maybe maybe elisa if you are interested in developing an expansion to Baffa Baffa through student gameplay testing, through play testing. Uh, that's yeah. something you and I could collaborate on. I would love that. That'd be great. Yeah, that sounds great. So, um, right now we have our first barbarians. We got to go into the next turn. Now, uh, question the in the unit you are near. Uh, chat. Um, so is this game are barbarians to be incorporated into the civilization or destroyed? Do they attack? They they attack and you are, um, you basically you can't negotiate them with them. You can't incorporate them into the civilization. They are to be wiped out, which is, again, a very very, <laughs> a mm. very uh, colonial point of view. Right. So. Um, we can now adopt the next policy, so you can choose aristocracy, which increases production when building wonders and increases happiness. I don't know when an aristocracy has ever increased anyone's happiness other than the <laughs> happiness of the aristocracy. But there you go. And then you have <laughs> oligarchy, where when the uh, queen comes to town, when the queen comes to town. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see, so garrison units cost no maintenance and cities with a garrison gain 50% ranged combat strength. So one is focused sort of in combat, the other one's in building. Uh, I'll go with aristocracy. Yeah. I think it's interesting that you can't trade, as you said, because that's one of the big, uh, you know, important aspects of, of, of the ancient world is that there was so much trade going on and that they were... And the um, thing is, is that you can trade, you just can't trade with barbarians. So if you incorporate oh. other, and this is the thing, this is an element where I might uh, skip ahead to my saved game so I can illustrate those elements of the game. Because yes. once once you've explored enough, you encounter other civilizations, other city-states, and you can begin to trade with them. Yeah, we have 15 minutes left, so, so yeah, let's so take a look at further... 15 minutes left, so why don't we go to the saved game. Go load game, and we'll do Nebuchadnezzar 850 BC in the classical era, so a little bit further along. Or BCE, as we would prefer to say. As we would say BCE, but the thing is, is most most people don't know, they're familiar with BC as opposed to BCE. Um, So you can see here, I've sort of, this version is much more expanded. Oh, wow. Two city-states here, Babylon and Akkad, with a road connecting them. I've got uh, my uh, first uh, wonder here, which is a great library. 
Uh, I got a series of farms and mines and uh, plantations. Uh, and then I've also got a caravan moving back and forth for trade between the city-state of Sidon. Now, uh, Sidon is actually relatively small. As I said before, here's Sidon right here. Uh, and if I click on them, you can see that we're friends. And you can um, do all sorts of diplomatic elements. So you can do diplomatic gifts, for example. So that I can teach students about reciprocity, for example, and the idea of gift economies, how um, gifts create social obligations and influence. So I can teach uh, elements of reciprocity there. Uh, we can, if we're, if we're going with a more imperialistic thing, we can ask someone for tribute. We can declare war on people. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about in the yep. a little bit of the time we have left is this concept of long time that is often lost on students, and I think it's so way, yeah. when it you know critical when it comes to things like climate change and understanding like you know fads come and go, but this concept of like time is a you know much more uh, like the ancient civilizations. It's one of the benefits we have is it really gives us a sense of the depth of time. And I feel like that is such a challenging concept for students today to get. You know, fashions are out in two months, right? Um, right. So how, how do you feel like this game does that? Does that help them understand that? I mean, the game moves it like 40, like you said, 40 years in a minute, right? Or 40 years a turn, but yes. Right. So I, like, for example, in the start of the game, you start about 4000 BC. I'm currently at 850 BC and it can go even, it can go even further. So, uh, yeah, it can definitely help with that concept of long time, um, which is important for concepts such as sustainability. In terms of sustainability, I would love if they would throw us a few curveballs. Uh, for example, oh, yeah. such as, you know, even a game as simple as Oregon Trail had those curveballs where, you know, there's a drought or somebody dies of dysentery or something like that because yeah. these are the sort of struggles that, you know, farms don't work perfectly every single time. So the idea of, you know, how do civilizations deal with climate change? How do civil, you know, if, if there is a, um, a uh, regional or worldwide turn in climate change, such as like the 4.2 kill year event that brought an end to the Akkadian Empire. You know, how did people adapt to that? And mm -hmm. how do relations between different city-states change as a result of that? Because there are fewer resources available, because there's a scarcity of resources due to drought, do, uh, does diplomacy take a nosedive? And is there a greater in uh, increase in right, like Settlers of Catan actually does have that with the oil um, expansion pack that they have. Yeah. Um, and then there were some researchers in Great Britain who created a global warming expansion pack for Settlers of Catan that you can use to kind of, that has those kinds of curveballs. So that sense that like, you know, there are going to be disasters that will hit you. And how does a civilization, what are the strengths of certain civilizations against different disasters? Like, you know, that autocratic um, traditional oligarchy might respond much more quickly mm -hmm. because they can just tell everyone what to do. Whereas ones that are much more value liberty are going to have a harder time getting people to wear masks. I mean, uh, respond <laughs> oh, too real, too real. Oh, too real. <laughs> Wow. Oh yeah. God! I still live in abject terror of going to the Home Depot because no one's wearing masks there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so, someone um, asks, uh, if I might interrupt, mm -hmm. um, do you finish a civilization when that civilization actually stops in history at a certain point, or do you just continue on forever with an, with an ancient civilization? It continues on to a certain point of technology. So until either all the other civilizations are conquered until essentially I believe the original game ended when once you reach the nuclear age mm. so it's a certain level of technology so for example if we go to the research info and uh, it's just trying to get to the technology tree open technology tree so you see the technology tree only goes so far once you reach future tech the game is over Whew. Right? 
So there's a certain element, and you can see different, you know, you can also explore uh, other elements. You know, Lisa is a communications professor. You can see here we have inventions such as the internet, globalization, particle physics, and different technologies that we ourselves have not developed yet, such as nuclear fission, which allows you to build the giant death robots. <laughs> so, um, so it's an interesting, what, it's an interesting what, element. What year is that going to be invented in according to this game? Uh, it's, it's in terms of years, uh, with a turn, uh, I have to do the math here. So future tech is 392 years. So 40 years, 40 times 392, 40 times 392 is 15,680 years. So if you start at 4,000 BC, we would be talking about... Year. Yeah, like the year 11,600. Oh, well, okay. We're not there yet, okay. Not quite there yet. <laughs> But again, I, but again, that that's if it remains constant. I believe that it could start um, with like 40-year increments, and then it becomes uh, the increments become shorter uh, the higher on the technology tree you go, because technological advancement moves faster uh, as you get further along in technology. Like look at the last look at the technological advances that we've had really oh, yeah. within just the last. 50 years oh yeah my mom would say if my grandmother would be, be alive again she has never even seen a car let alone everything else so yes no. so um wow. so yeah i mean this is definitely a, f a great fun element to explore uh vis-a-vis -vis archaeo gaming uh vis-a-vis -vis, um game design um as a tool for play uh lisa i think you're very right in that it is it is challenging in that it's it is a long-term game it would be very mm -hmm. difficult for students to get an overall experience playing this game in say an hour and 15 minute class session it's simply not going to happen um uh, it, and so and just you um talking about stuff is already very enlightening you showing um, the different menus, the different options by itself is already enough to spark conversation. You don't actually have to play the game from beginning to end. Exactly, which is which is why, at least in, in the original class, I had students play briefly as partners, but most of it is exactly what you're s seeing right now on Twitch. You know, watching mm -hmm. me or watching an, a single other student play the game and then focusing in on comments. And these are other things you can do, like you can zoom in, for example, yeah, and, and it has, like, really beautiful graphics, and it's extremely, obviously, like, you know, mm. this is a very, you know, um, a, a, a purchasable game, right? It's it's obviously yeah. meant for consumer purchase. Um, but there are lots of games out there that I think we shouldn't overlook just because they aren't as pretty or they aren't as well-developed. There's a lot of text-based games that I think mm -hmm. can be very helpful, like... Um, I, I have one that's called Seed Ship, Sh Seed Ship that I like to play with my students, and it's mm -hmm. something you can do just in a class period of an hour to an hour and fifteen minutes. It's a text-based game, and it's um it's you're on a seed ship out in in outer space, and um, one of the nice things about this game is that every time you play it, it's a totally different game. It has the same mechanics, and you understand like. The decision matrix once you understand it it's a very simple game to understand um but it's random gonna assign different kinds of e events that will happen that will affect your gameplay and the students can together make decisions about what choices they're going to make as a group um are they going to you know uh, prioritize um protecting their uh seeds are they going to prioritize protecting their cultural knowledge are they going to protect prior because they're in the middle of the you know deep space and um, they have to try to find a planet that they can build on and that they can create a civilization. Um, and so that's a nice one-off game. You don't have to invest a ton of time for the whole semester. You can just play that once and then it's a nice prompt for discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's the, that's the other end of the extreme, right? Is like you invest, this kind of game I think gives you so much to deal with really in deep yeah. concepts. 
but it also is a trade-off in the amount of time you then have to kind of invest. Although I like, Tina, your suggestion that you can just play it for the students and show them the before and after. That's always an option, too. Right. Or, or like you said, maybe tutorial videos, but not tutorial videos, like actual videos uh, that right. people can watch instead on YouTube or whatever um, that you make about the game. So they don't, they just have to watch the videos. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's, it, it, it really is about how much time you have and are willing to ex explore in your class. Right? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, so just to, just for the heck of it, I'm gonna go ahead and attack the city, just because it's a uh, it's a chance to show how sort of the expansion element also also works. So you can take over other city states and, and eliminate them and stuff like that. But um, and and so. You win the game when time is out, or how do you win? You win the game by uh, reaching, I believe you reach the end of the technology tree first. Ah, so you're competing in fastness. Yeah, well, you're, you're competing in, in speed, but really it's, it's the idea of the growth of your civilization. Um, it's expansion, not just in terms of territory, but in terms of technology. And the thing is, is that, again, this game is based a lot on that sort of colonialist idea. The more ter you expand and the more territory you get, the more resources you get. The more resources you get, the more you're able to advance your technology because you have the resources to develop it. Mm -hmm. And so once you reach that sort of pinnacle of technology, then you're considered to have, quote unquote, won the game. Mm -hmm. Although I don't think anybody ever wins civilization. I like the uh, the animation of the two the, the people down there hoeing the fields. Mm -hmm. That's fun to watch. And you can zoom in and zoom in. Oh, this is my uh, my unit here needs orders. Let's see what can I do with this worker. Uh, can you zoom work. in even more, or is this like the this most? This is as you much as you in. can zoom in. Okay. Because I'm looking if I uh, if I see any non-white men around. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I will. Let's see. Do I want to move this guy out? Uh, so I'll buy a tile. I'll expand down here. Return to the map. Send this guy down here. And now I also have ships that I can move around to. So you can see that here are some of the things that you can also also do is you can begin to explore other areas as well. Oh, look at that. So you can see overalls. And again, but again, it's sort of weird. You've got Panama City right next to Babylon and Akkad. <laughs> and and Jakarta. Right here. And then right over here is Jakarta. So Definitely not a game to teach ge 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 <laughs> geography, <laughs> geography <laughs> students, no. <laughs> I would not say... Yeah, ge geography students would not. City. Yeah. Yeah, my advisor is telling me, please don't besiege cities. And it's like, no, but I want to besiege the city. This is fun. <laughs> I also find it interesting that none of these games ever really care about the population, right? The individuals. Yes. It's all about the grand strategy. Um, it's not about providing what your citizens would want or need. Right, right. Well, that to some degree but don't forget there's also the happiness quotient up here right so the idea of, of happiness increases from having more resources so if you have gems marbles dyes silk yeah, that's not what makes happiness more Michael. economic opportunity <laughs> yeah, but again it's this very colonialist <laughs> capitalist point of view right i the have more resources no you have the more luxuries <laughs> I have no you have gems. I have no marble and I have no silk in my <laughs> life, but I'm pretty happy. <laughs> exactly. Uh, 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 uh. I play a game uh, called Fallout Shelter, I think it's called. Yes, and it, yes. Mm -hmm. it definitely happiness quotient. You can individually improve an individual person's happiness, um, you know, and and or decrease it. Like if there's a, there's one dog that you can assign to people and it'll automatically increase their happiness. And I always wonder, well, what if they're allergic? 
<laughs> you allergic to happiness? Oh, you're allergic to, to dogs. dogs. <laughs> like, it isn't gonna make everybody doesn't love dogs, but apparently this magical dog, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I always find it interesting what playing these guy these kind of games does to your mental psyche. Mm -hmm. Like, if you grow up playing these kind of games. Does it influence the way you look at the world in a more strategic way, or do you care less about the individual, or do you do you appreciate colonialism more because you've been playing these games? Does it actually have that I, much I, of a I, power I, that yeah. it can? I, I think if you're having the discussion about colonialism, then it makes mm. you disapprove of colonialism mm. more. But I think the the other interesting thing it's, it's it's odd that you talk about individuals because another thing that you can do in the game is create what are called great individuals right huh. such as great the great scientist for example so um which is very very interesting because it even also ex like allows you to explore the concept of agency in archaeology which is a huge mm. thing in post-processual archaeology and in our interpretive mm -hmm. archaeology is the idea of right. looking at questions of agency and also looking at the greater impact that individual human beings can have on uh on culture mm -hmm. and you know, that's a great question because really ultimately the question is what can a game do and what can mm -hmm. a game not do? And one of the things that games are actually really good at is teaching about systems and teaching mm -hmm. systems thinking. And that's actually one of the areas that I research is how does it, systems thinking and that sense of understanding complex interactions can really actually help people understand certain processes more than others. Not that mm -hmm. it will necessarily help them with just, you know, colonialism, but that's why I'm interested in games with climate change because climate's uh, a sophisticated system. Games are often sophisticated systems. And so does learning how to play a particular complex game actually create the mental faculty like a skill-based set that allows people to understand things like climate change a little bit better and to have that understanding that then helps translate into action or support in that area. So that's right. a really great question. Hmm. That We should do a whole episode just on that question. <laughs> I'm uh, sure. Because we are out of time. <laughs> uh, we are out of time. More, oh my but goodness. We are out of time. See, we were so much in the flow, in the zone, that we totally forgot um, what time it is. All right. right. Uh, so I will go ahead and exit the game, exit to Windows. So thank you very much, guys, uh, for coming on this month. This was really great. And as I said, we will upload this to YouTube and Facebook Live in a couple of days. So if you want your friends to see and hear what we talked about, um, you can refer them to that video. Any, any last comments, Michael or um, Lisa? I, this was great fun. Thanks so much for inviting me. Do it again sometime. Yeah, same here. Thank you so very much tonight. I really, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about all of these things today and, and explore all these different elements. Yeah, I think um, Civ Five is such a, uh, as, as Lisa rightly pointed out, it's such a long-term game that it's, um, you know, you could spend days playing Civilization mm. V online with friends and discussing all these different elements, discussing colonialism, discussing agency, discussing... Um, archaeological theories and approaches. There are all of these different elements that can be uh, explored. And I want to thank you and I want to thank Sasa for allowing us to explore those today. You are welcome. And uh, we will be back next month, I believe April 10, when we will be playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey. So I hope that you will join us then again. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. And we can 